So um, basically, as I was saying, um, you know, they talk about how World War Three could start as the as Gog starts to rise and these Tartarian warlords start to reunite. Now, if you're not familiar with what Tartaria is, it is a it is essentially a, a lost empire that is recorded in maps and in old encyclopedias from, you know, a uh, hundred years ago that most of us have never even heard about. <clears throat> now, what is so fascinating about this is this is an article. Now, it took over. It was all of the Asian continent, including China, Russia, things like that. Now, when you start looking at Tartarian warlords, this is where it gets fascinating. This is from the Epoch Times. Russia, China, plotting behind the scenes ahead of Ukrainian invasion. This is according to a congressman. So let's take a look at it. Oh, and of course it's not going to let me look at it because it's a premium article. But, you know, that is, and for whatever reason, it let me read it earlier. I don't understand. Um, now, it, it was fascinating just listen to that. So the picture under the picture, it says Russian President Vladimir Putin and Chinese President Xi Jinping walk as they attend a meeting at, of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Council of Heads of State in Bishkek on uh, June 14, 2019. So, I mean, obviously, these guys are going to be a little bit chummy. They, they, they're they separated, um, but they, you know, they're basically on the same landmass. So. When you look at that, now you've got things like we just showed you from Not the Bee. So let me try to play that a little bit again. So, so the in-law anti-tank weapons for Ukraine. So let's play this a little bit again. Secondly, I'm making this video as I'm interested in anti-tank weapons. And the UK has just announced the transfer of light anti-tank weapons to Ukraine in light of the continuing tensions with Russia. The UK is the latest nation to announce that they will be providing weapons to Ukraine. They follow US shipments of Javelin missiles late last year, and we've already seen these in the hands of Ukrainian troops. Most recently, it's been confirmed that Lithuania will supply anti-tank systems too. The UK's Defence Minister Ben Wallace stated that we've taken the decision to supply Ukraine with light anti-armour defensive weapon systems. While that doesn't specifically name Enlaw, it does describe the role which Enlaw fills. What is Enlaw? Enlaw is a disposable single shot system which weighs about 12.5 kilograms or 27.5 pounds. It uses a predicted line of sight guidance system which identifies the selected target and calculates where that target will be when the missile reaches it. Like Javelin, it's capable of targeting the tank's weakest point, its top side. The Enlaw has two firing modes, Direct attack, with the missile flying directly to the point of aim, useful for engaging static targets. While the second, overfly top attack, uses the predicted line of sight or PLOS system, where the guidance algorithm optimizes the trajectory of the warhead on an elevated flight path above the target, with the onboard proximity fuse in the warhead then detonating and firing an explosively formed penetrator down on. All right, so I think you get the point um, there. The main thing I wanted us to get from that is the U.K. is now sending weapons over there, so we've got other countries getting involved picking sides, um, which may not be a big deal. These things like this happen, but, of course, when alliances forge and they start, you know, this is the first step in what could potentially be bigger. Now... You know, what's the big deal here? So let's look at this. Let me move that so I can have everything in order. So this is, of course, this is from Russia Today. Um, this was posted um, <clears throat> last month, January 19th, 2022. The CIA's high-stakes game in Ukraine. Purported plans for guerrilla war could see the country brought to the brink. Um... This is um, written by Tariq Cyril Amar, a historian from Germany at some university in Istanbul that I can't, per I, I can't pronounce, working on Russia, Ukraine, and Eastern Europe, the history of World War II, the cultural Cold War, and the politics of memory. So with fears 
of a conflict breaking out between Russia and Ukraine, which it has. There has been no end of speculation of how the standoff could spiral into all-out fighting. Some of the theories and purported plans come with evidence. Others don't. But in their own way, they're all intriguing. Not surprising, but still revealing, are reports that The CIA have trained special forces in Ukraine to defend the country against a possible invasion. In all likelihood, the scheme would have included far-right fighters. Through well-timed leaks and statements by anonymous, quote, persons familiar and conveniently retired U.S. officers, these trainees are now presented as the potential backbone of a guerrilla-style resistance force. The purpose of advertising this fact now is clear. To deter Russia from launching the large-scale attack of Ukraine on Ukraine that Washington alleges is coming. Moscow denies planning but won't rule out either. And Kiev is uh, Kiev cannot really make up its own mind about if you, Russia, occupy substantial parts of Ukrainian uh, territory. So goes the American message. We'll turn this into a bloody quagmire for you. In essence, what the late U.S. National Security Advisor... Um, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who I think I said that right, was always proud of having done in and to Afghanistan during the Soviet intervention in the 1980s. The training program was started under Obama and extended under Trump. Another nail in the coffin of claims he was a Russian agent. And then Biden. It inhabits a twilight world of ambiguous terminology and not very plausible deniability. Somehow, it's all very defensive, allegedly, but then again, it, in reality, it is of, of course not, and no one is actually supposed to buy the cover story because it would have little deterrence value. The, quote, tactical skills taught in such programs are, of course, at least as useful for attack and sabotage as for, quote, mere intelligence gathering and defense. Never mind that there is a, quote, good chance that the CIA is training actual literal Nazis, end quote, as Jacobin has put it, entirely realistically. If you have any idea at all about the virulence and the modus operandi of the Ukrainian far right, then you know that this is exactly the opportunity it caters it its caters crave. And if you have any realism left about what the CIA does, then you know that it does not mind training fanatics. Never did from Latin America via Afghanistan to Syria and Ukraine. In fact, if anything, the agency has a massive bias for them. Now, some of you may look at this article. Um, and, of course, it's from a foreign government's, uh, you know, news source, albeit it's from the government that's being pitched as the aggressor in this. Uh, whether that's true or not, I do not know, and I'm not going to make any claims. I'm just here to read the news for you. Now, this is from Counterpunch. Now, we did a little digging, went back on this for this one. This is from Counterpunch, July 30th, 2014. The, the media ignores the CIA in Ukraine by Bill Blunden. A few days back, the, ec- the Economist published an essay which dismissed the idea of fascists in Kiev as an illusion or and as, illus- at, bleh, as an illusory product of Russian propaganda. This is a narrative which the editors at The Economist have put forth on a number of occasions. Of course, they're not alone. A less flagrant article published by the New York Times editorial board used a weird double negative to assert that, quote, Russian leaders prefer not to accept that the CIA did not engineer the preference of many Ukrainians for what they see in the West, end quote. (coughs) All the world's stage, all the world's a stage, wrote Shakespeare. Are readers supposed to categorically assume that the U.S. intelligence has played absolutely no role in the coup d'etat? So far, the bulk of the American media's coverage of the Ukraine deftly sidesteps the CIA's role. Yet, all of the signs are there. Former CIA officer John Stockwell explained that, quote, stirring up deadly ethnic and racial strife has been a standard technique used by the CIA, end quote. Hmm. 
Interesting, because that's exactly what is happening in our own country right now. Students of history, um, examples given, Iran, Guatemala, Indonesia, Chile, Nicaragua, uh, will also recognize many of the hallmarks of a covert destabilization operation. Witness Senator John McCain sharing a stage with Ole Tianibok in the early days of the coup, CIA Director Brennan's discreet visit to the Ukraine buried near the end of a Reuters brief, the taped phone call where Victoria Nuland essentially selects who would replace the deposed president, or the disproportionate number of high-level officials in the new government linked to neo-fascist groups. So there we have that again. A second witness that points to that. Once again, not saying it's true or not. That's not my job. I'm merely here to present you with the information. You come to your own conclusions. The article goes on. This last point is particularly telling and worth highlighting because the CIA has a well-documented history of supporting authoritarian regimes. And if the far right represents only a small contingent of the Ukrainian electorate, as we've been told by allegedly credible sources like Timothy Snyder, how exactly did they end up with so many powerful government slots? A report by FAIR provides unsettling details. Quote, the new deputy prime minister, uh, Alexander Sitch, um, is from um, Svoboda. National Security Secretary Andrei Perubi is co-founder of the neo-Nazi Social National Party, Svoboda's earlier incarnation. The Deputy Secretary for National Security, Dimitro Yarosh, the head of uh, right sector, Chief Prosecutor Ole Manitsky, is another Svoboda member as are the members for the agricultural and ecology. So, as far as the CIA operational details are concerned, the corporate media has enforced line discipline across the board. This shouldn't come as any surprise, as the media's penetration by the intelligence community has been public knowledge since the days of church committee report. In fact, May of this year, the White House and a um, screw-up, you get the guys, get the point. So, um, and why would the media not report on the CIA's involvement? Well, that's easy. That's Operation Mockingbird is all that is. So, but you get that there. Now, what I find interesting is, you know, let's look at the past 10 years. So, we can go back um, at some point in in my high school career, which was over 10 years ago. I remember... You, uh, Russia invading Georgia. And, um, you know, then there was, uh, in 2014, it was Russia invading Crimea. And now they're invading Ukraine. So, but let's look at something a little more recent where we have aggression towards Russia that was completely made up um, by some of our own politicians. So this is from Neon Nettle. FBI report reveals Russiagate was a complete hoax from the start. Now, most of us know this. But it says a new FBI report has confirmed the Trump-Russia collusion was a hoax and should not put any arguments to bed for good. Or should put any arguments to bed for good, excuse me. The report focused on Igor Danchenko the primary researcher for the debunked Steele dossier, who was arrested by special counsel John Durham last week. Danchenko lied to the Bureau when questioned when questioned about his role in, quote, Russiagate. But reaching farther than that, than the lies he told the FBI, it is more about how Russiagate came into existence. The original scandal was the Steele dossier, created by former British spy Christopher Steele, who was commissioned by the American company Fusion GPS to dig up uh, first on uh, dig up dirt. I think is what that's supposed to be on Donald Trump. Now, what's interesting about this is back after 2016, I used to love to listen to conservative radio. Um, this was before my awakening to 
the way that politics actually work worldwide. Um, but I used to love to listen to conservative radio and uh, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Sean Hannity would come on. Now, I'm very familiar with the Steele Dossier and Fusion GPS because that is all that Hannity would ever talk about. He would not talk about anything else. Like this guy, if this was a dead horse, he beat it to an unrecognizable pulp. So, um, Dan Chaco, anyway, that, that's just, I mean, and if, and if you ever listen to conservative radio, you know that that was a thing. Like, this was all anybody talked about. This was the, what I like to call the conservative talking bike. So, for instance, CNN was always orange man bad. Well, the right always had the counter. Well, the steel dossier, fusion GPS. And then what they would do is they would use these as a tactic to get people fighting back and forth, divide the people. That's neither here nor there. That's just uh, every time it, it's almost like, um, Oh goodness. What's it called? Um, you know, it's almost like you have an, a, a, an anxiety based aversion is what I have every time I see Fusion GPS. I'm just like, oh. Anyway, the article goes on to say uh, Danchenko was paid by Steele to do the work for him. Now, the, the article says the indictment reveals for the first time that Danchenko in turn made use of the services of somebody referred to as PR Executive One, who has been identified by the press as one Chuck Dolan. And it's here that things begin to truly get interesting. As the charge sheet states, during his career, Dolan has served as chairman of a national democratic political organization, state, uh, quote, uh, state chairman of President Clinton's 1992 and 1996 presidential campaigns, and an advisor to Hillary Clinton's 2008 presidential campaign. And so it turns out that the allegations that Trump was a Russian agent hinged on a report commissioned by the Democratic Party, which relied heavily on information provided by somebody who was once an official in that party. The corrupt circularity of it is quite extraordinary. Now, this is where this is where uh, mo most of your conservative people that are talking about this are going to say, so see... This is why they're going to then praise Trump as the white knight who's going to save everything in 2024. And you're not going to get that from me because if and many of you are familiar with the fact that um, it was myself and Dan, at least to a lot of our audience, there were others who were talking about it, but not many. We brought forth the fact that Trump's truth uh, social is funded and paid for by communist China. So, I mean, it's not like it's any better. Yeah, the Russian one may be made up, and the Democratic Party may actually have Russian ties, but we also know they have Chinese ties, and so does President Trump. So, I mean, either way, you're not getting a good candidate, and everybody, I get it, you know, everybody's going to talk about, well, it's the lesser of two evils. But a lesser evil is still evil no matter how you look at it. Now, you can go back to the old quote, um, the triumph of evil is when good men do nothing, but not voting is not the same as doing nothing. Rather, if it were somebody that was not voting because they knew the truth but chose not to speak about it, that is doing nothing. But when you know the truth, you're speaking about the truth, and you're trying to warn people of the corrupt system on both sides, I hardly would call that doing nothing. Rather, what we're trying to do is we're trying to sound the alarm and let people know that they're in a giant trap, essentially, something that is designed to keep them dazed. Now, if you're familiar with Dan over at Truth Radio Show, he essentially has... This uh, intro where it's Alex Jones talking about how the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are used to prop each other up so that way the elite party that's the actual ruling class sits on top of them and it won't tumble. That is 100% spot on accurate. 
And many of you know that I'm not a huge Alex Jones fan either. Alex Jones is just as bad as, in my opinion, as some of the elite that he is exposing because he's involved in the same mystical arts. He's just involved in the white hand bath. That's not okay. The Bible condemns sorcery of all kinds and witchcrafts of all kinds, not just black magic. It, 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 it magic in general. The Bible says that we are to put our trust in Jesus Christ and him alone. Now, we cannot do that if we are too busy talking to ascended masters and whatnot and trying to get the Christ energy in us because there is no Christ energy. There's Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the end of the story as far as for what can renew our minds. It starts with Christ and him crucified. The only other place you can go after that is following Christ's commandments, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that's it. Paul says, I I fear that you have become, uh, you've been corrupted by the simplicity that is Christ. And yeah, that's what a lot of people have been corrupted by. They, they, They can't fathom how simple it is just to do what he says. That's why Christ says you have to come to him as a child. A parent says to your child, do this. They may ask why, you give them a reason, and then they do it. It's that simple. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Why? God says, well, uh, six days you work, and on the seventh you rest. Why? Because six days he created the world, and on the seventh he rested. It's that simple. So let's move on to the next story. So I think you guys get that here. So... But before I move on to the next story, that, that's, that's the key to this all. You may be getting anxiety over these things, and hey, I get it. I really do. But that's the answer. Just follow Jesus Christ. John 14 says this. Let's head over there real quick. Jesus says in verse 25, These things I have spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send you in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring in, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I, Jesus, have said unto you. Right? So let's back up. Verse 18. Well, he's going to send us the Comforter, right? He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. This is a promise in Jesus. We will find life in Jesus Christ if we accept his atoning blood that he sacrificed on the cross, let it wash away our sins, and we continue to follow what he says afterwards. So, and look, yeah, some people are going to die physically. Their body is going to be no more. They'll breathe their last on this earth. But they will live verily, verily. This is John eight fifty two. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, if a man keep my saying, he shall not see death. <coughs> that is a promise from Jesus. Yeah, your body may die in appearance to all of us. But Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's, you're going to close your eyes here and you're going to be in heaven with the creator. So you have nothing to fear. Jesus says, fear not them who can destroy the body, but fear him who can destroy the body and the soul and cast it into hell. Now we're going to be talking about that more on the main show 
tomorrow night, um, as this is recording, Saturday night, tomorrow night, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Course Correction Radio YouTube channel. We're going to be talking about what will send people to hell. Because the reality is, is if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and following his commandments, there's no power of hell. As the song says, no power of hell, no scheme of man that could ever pluck you from his hand. Because you are in step with the Holy Spirit. So, I want to put your mind at ease with that before we go any further. Because... I mean, this is stressful stuff. So this is the Durham report. And then I think we're going to take a small break. I'm going to try to get some water. Because if I go any farther, I'm going to start actually sounding like Alex Jones. Which I'm sure will give you guys a, a, a good laugh. But um, but let's read this real quick. So the Durham report proves Hillary Clinton, not Trump, was Putin's puppet. Now, I don't know if puppet is necessarily the right word there. Well, let's read it. Since 2016, Hillary Clinton has been trolling Donald Trump on social media over his alleged ties to Russia, calling him Putin's puppet. But special counsel John Durham's probe has uncovered the truth about who was Putin's puppet. It was Clinton herself. She and the Obama-Biden administration spy agency chiefs and their corrupt minions were unknowingly, or perhaps even knowingly, Putin's little helpers in tearing our country apart. <coughs> it turns out the Clinton that Clinton and her top foreign policy advisor, Jake Sullivan, spread a bogus Trump-Russia collusion narrative to enable this Soviet-style disinformation campaign. Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign hired a tech firm to infiltrate servers at Trump Tower in Manhattan and at the White House in order to link Donald Trump to Russia. By the way, I don't think I said where this article is. This is the New York Post. So, um, immediately following the 2016 election, the Russia-Trump collusion conspiracy became the intelligence community's bright and shiny object. Serious intelligence briefings about the Russia threat and what Putin was up to were interrupted by national security officials asking irrelevant questions like, what do the Russians have on Trump? Uh, This was a major distraction that diverted intelligence resources and Washington's attention from real threats like China, Iran, and Putin's hostile actions in Europe and Ukraine. Um, various, quote, deep state operatives, the Democratic consulates, Washington establishment, uh, Conyuncenti, I think is how you say that word, and the media aided Clinton in digging up and spreading this dirt on Trump, yada, yada, you guys get the point. Um, so, yeah. Of course, everything that we've been told about that is an obvious lie. And that's the point I want to get out about this with with the Russia stuff is keep an eye on it. You know, the Bible tells us to be watchmen on the wall. You know, we're to look for the signs of the times. One of those is wars and rumors, rumors of wars. Um, So, but we're going to take a break and then we're going to come back and talk about what you really need to keep an eye on as this mounts up. And that is Iran. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back here with the next segment on 33.3 News.